The lecture tonight is titled The Man Behind the Mask because we want to know who the man behind the scenes is that is going to play a major role in the events culminating in the very end events before the coming of Christ. And the book of Daniel gives us a lot of information on this issue. And in fact, the book of Daniel, as we have said before, forms the template for the book of Revelation. And the prophecy that we will be going through tonight is a prophecy that acts as a key for the book of Revelation. Again, I'd like to remind you of our little dictionary of prophetic terms. White linen, righteousness, trumpet, wind is a symbol of war. Trumpet can also be a symbol of judgment. Prostitution is idolatry, being unfaithful to God. Water or sea equals nations, Revelation 17.5. A woman, you will remember, is a church, Zion, God's people. Tonight we're going to deal with beasts and kingdoms, and we'll see the definitions there for ourselves. And horns and kings and kingdoms, we'll see those definitions for ourselves as well. And the rock is Jesus. There are many, many texts um, indicating that. So let us have a look at this vision tonight of Daniel chapter 7. It's one of the most thunderous visions in the Bible. It's really staggering. And it's actually quite scary. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, so this is right towards the end of the Babylonian um, kingdom, Daniel had a dream. So now it's not the king who has a dream, but Daniel who has a dream. And obviously Daniel is going to get more detail than the king had in his previous vision, which was the sort of the ABC of prophecy. He had a dream and a vision of his head upon his bed, and then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. So he's going to explain it. We don't have to guess about this issue. Daniel 7, verses 2 and 3, And I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds, what was that? War of heaven strove upon the great sea. So there was war among the nations. And four great beasts, kingdoms, came up from the sea, diverse from one another. They were different to each other. Daniel 7, verses 2 and 3. So now let's just make sure that we have this right. Bible prophecy symbols, remember the sea is people, nations, multitudes, Revelation 17, 15, wind, we said was war, Jeremiah 49, 36 and 37, beasts or kingdoms, Daniel 7, 17. Let's read those texts to make absolutely sure. Revelation 17, 15, the waters which thou sawest are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So, here's the first symbol. Let's go to Jeremiah and see what we can see here. 49, verse 36, and upon Elam will I bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven and will scatter them towards all those winds and there shall be no nation whither the outcasts of Elam shall not come. Verse 37, for I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies. Now we call that Hebrew parallelism. Something is explained in one way and then repeated in another way and in that way the symbols are explained. They are self-explanatory then. So the four winds which scatter Elam it mean that Elam will be dismayed before their enemies. There will be wars. And before them that seek their life, and I will bring evil upon them, even my fierce anger, says the Lord, and I will send the sword, war, after them till I have consumed them. So there you have the parallelism so that you can see that the sea equals the nations and the wind equals the wars. Daniel 7.17 The four great beasts are four computers in Brussels. No. Oh, no, it doesn't say that at all. It says, the four great beasts are four kingdoms. 
kingdoms that will arise from the earth. So four kingdoms are going to come, and they're described as beasts. 1723, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. So that's the biblical definition. We cannot make it anything other than what the Bible says it's going to be. So the four beasts are four kingdoms that shall arise upon the earth. And now we can look at the kingdoms and see where we are going. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand upon the feet as a man and a man's heart was given to it. Daniel 7 verse 4. Now the first kingdom that we had in Daniel chapter 2, the head of gold, Daniel identified it as what? Babylon. The first beast we see here is the lion with eagle's wings, which, by the way, was the symbol, one of the symbols of Babylon. And what is fascinating here is that this beast was made to stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. This is a system, a kingdom that exalts the human above the divine. This is the ultimate apostasy against God. Putting man in the place where God should be. And we will see as we continue in this series that end time events also culminate in this very matter. Man being placed where the divine should be. So Bob L, as I've already said, Babel, Bab is gate, L is God, portal to God, another way to God, another way, other than the prescribed way, which we find in the Bible. So here is this power that will arise, and it stands for Babylon. It parallels the head of gold, 605 to 539 B.C. Let's have a look at Jeremiah for the symbolism. Jeremiah 4 verse 7, A lion has come out of his lair. A destroyer of nations has set out. He has left his place to lay waste your land. The prophet is speaking to Israel, Jerusalem. Your towns will lie in ruins without inhabitants. And the lion he was referring to was the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. Babylon was going to come. And Jeremiah applies the symbol of the lion to Babylon. So the first kingdom is Babylon. Here's a symbol that was used in Babylon. You can see the lion with the eagle's wings, part of that symbolism. Here's another relief. And there again you see the lions with the eagle's wings, symbols of Babylon. So archaeology confirms that was the symbolism that was used. So we do not have to guess at what was to transpire. The Bible gives us a good start. Daniel chapter 2 started with Babylon. Daniel chapter 7 starts with Babylon. And suddenly another beast, replace that with another word, kingdom, a second like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth and they said thus to it arise devour much flesh Daniel 7 verse 5 so this beast is going to come and it's going to devour the flesh of the previous one it's going to make war and replace it and it had three ribs and one side was higher than the other now, what was the next kingdom in Daniel chapter 2? It was Medo-Persia. Now, we have a little bit more detail here. The Medes and the Persians weren't equally yoked. At first, the Medes were the prominent one and was raised up on one side. Later on, the Persians rose to be the equivalent and even higher. So, it was not equal in uh, its power. 
So the next kingdom to come along would be Medo-Persia, three ribs in its mouth. There were three major wars associated with that conquest. So Medo-Persia represents, is the parallel of the arms of silver and the chest, and they ruled from 539 to 331 BC. And there are the thrusts that they made, the one into Lydia, conquering these portions of the Babylonian Empire, the other thrust to Babylon itself, and the third one down into Egypt, and they basically conquered the entire Babylonian kingdom with these three conquests representing the three ribs in their mouth. Daniel 7 verse 6, After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings, as of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. That's fascinating. Daniel 7 verse 6, The next kingdom to come along, of course, was the Greek kingdom. And here it is described as a leopard. Remember the animals? There's a lion, there's a bear, and now there's a leopard. And four heads associated with this beast. How many heads on the first one? One head. How many heads on the second one? One head plus four heads. And uh, interesting story. After this I beheld and lo another, like a leopard, which had upon its back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. So the next kingdom to come along was Greece, 331 to 168 BC. And when Greece was at the height of its power, Alexander the Great died after a night of drunken stupor. He lingered for a while and then died. And the kingdom was divided into four, the four generals, Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucid kingdom. That is the division of the Greek empire into four. Fascinating. So there were four heads. So now we already have a total of six heads. The lion, the bear, plus the four, makes six. After this, Daniel 7 verse 7, I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. Do you remember the symbol of iron? Where did we find it? In Daniel chapter 2, and it was a symbol of the Roman Empire. Here we have the same symbolism. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. Here's this mighty empire, politically the most powerful of the four, and it would destroy and devour with its feet. And there's something very interesting about it. Daniel 7 verse 7. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Right. There are no numbers of heads mentioned here, so we assume it had one head with ten horns. So if you count all the heads of the beasts of Daniel chapter 7, how many heads do we have? We have seven heads. Seven heads. Now the beasts that we will find in the book of Revelation have seven heads. And the beasts in the book of Revelation with the seven heads also have all the components of the beasts that are mentioned here in Daniel chapter 7. So we must know what each of these heads represents and what the philosophies were that were associated with those time periods. Now this particular beast was also different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now the ten horns, as we saw, in the definitions, would also be kingdoms. Verse 24 says, And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. So, out of Rome, ten kingdoms would arise. And another shall rise after them. 
So after the ten had arisen, after Rome had been divided into ten, another one would arise. And he shall be diverse from the first. And he shall subdue three kings. All right, this is fascinating. So the fourth beast divides into ten, but it's still basically that beast. It's still that beast that divides into ten. And out of this beast, amongst the division of the ten, comes another power, and he is the one that adds the different flavor. Is that clear? Is that what the text says? He shall be diverse, different from the first. So Rome will be different to the others because of that beast. And he will rule for how long? Until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints. That's a long, long time. Very long, long time. So Rome ruled from 168 BC to 476 AD. It will divide into ten. How many toes did the previous prophecy depict? Ten toes. There we have the ten again. Divide into ten. Another will arise after them. And he will be different. And the system will remain how long? Until the Ancient of Days shall come. Who? Long time. So we're talking about a long, long time span. Rome ruled from 168 BC to 476 AD, and then it was divided up. So we have exactly the same sequence. We have the lion depicting the head of gold, then we have the bear depicting the arms and the chest of silver. We have this four-headed leopard representing the hips of bronze. And then we have the terrible beast representing the legs of iron. And the ten toes, when it divides into ten, plus it will be different because of another that arises after them. So that's what we have so far. Daniel chapter 7, verse 19 to 20 and 23. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse, different from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, bronze. So there was an element of bronze in this fourth beast. Bronze was a very important component. Now, in actual fact, the Greek Empire was basically just incorporated by Rome. Greek philosophy was the very basis of the Roman Empire. And in fact, when Rome split into the two legs, the one was the Byzantine Empire and the other one the Western Empire, and the empire was ruled from Constantinople, and that is where Greek philosophy abounded. Greek philosophy was the, the philosophy of the time. So there's this element of brass, of bronze. Bronze claws scratched. And we'll find uh, these nails also interestingly uh, elsewhere later on. Which devoured broken pieces and stamped the residue with its feet. So he wanted to know about this terrible fourth beast. The fourth beast, we are told in verse 23, <clears throat> shall be a fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms, and shall devour how much of the earth? The whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. Now, did Rome, in its original form, take over the whole world, yes or no? Yeah. No. No. What about China? What about Japan? What about the Philippines? What about Australia? What about uh, Southern Africa? What about the United States? What about South America? What about those areas? Did Rome rule over all of those? Yes or no? Obviously not. But remember, the prophecy doesn't say Rome ends. The prophecy says that Rome is divided into ten 
and that another arises after them who rules until when? Until the Ancient of Days comes. So the prophecy can still be fulfilled in that context. Doesn't that make sense? Okay. That's very interesting. So here we have this mighty Roman Empire. This is what the Bible says. There would be these kingdoms and ten horns would arise, ten kingdoms. Ten kingdoms represent the ten toes. Uh, 476 until the second coming of Christ. These powers would somehow continue and the little one after him that would arise later he would be the different element and he would rule until the Ancient of Days came along. Daniel 2 verse 44, remember, talking about the ten toes, which are the equivalent of the ten horns, says, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So we have a perfect parallel between Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. Now, Daniel was wondering about this. And in verse 8 it says, I was considering the horns. So he's looking down the stream of time and he's looking to where Rome divides up into ten components and he's looking at these ten kingdoms that arise out of the Roman Empire. And there was another horn, a little one. Actually it says from littleness. It was first small and then it grew bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Coming up, where does it come up? among them. All right, so this little horn comes up among the ten. Very important, because this little horn is the man behind the mask. And this little horn comes up amongst the ten. So the ten kingdoms are there, and he arises amongst them. So what type of power is this? This is a European power. Because the ten horns arose out of the Western Roman Empire. So can we look for this little horn in the Middle East, for example? Yes or no? No. Can we look for this little horn in the United States of America, for example? No. Where do we have to look for him? There where he's supposed to arise. He has to come up among the ten. He comes up among the ten. And all ten are there when he arises. Notice before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. So because of this power, three of the ten had to be removed. Does that make sense? We're going to take three away. And who's going to take them away? Or as a consequence of whom will they be removed? This power. It's very important that we get him absolutely spot on because we don't want to make a mistake. And there in this horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. Where did we find this symbolism earlier? This man symbolism? Babylon, remember? Found it in Babylon. Here's the same symbolism. In this power... Man will once again lift himself up above the Most High and take the place of the Most High. This is another Bab El, another portal to heaven. Man exalting himself above the divine with pompous words. He's speaking against God. All right, so now we have some history. He arises. Out of the division of the Roman Empire, once it is divided into ten, then only does he make his appearance. Three of them are bothersome to him. They are eliminated under his influence. And then he rises up like a mushroom and sets man above the divine. That's what it says. That's what it says. 
And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another, there he is, shall rise after them. Question, does he arise out of the remnant of the Roman Empire or out of the remnant of the Greek Empire? Roman Empire. Roman Empire. Don't forget that. The stone also struck the feet. It struck which empire? The Greek or the Roman Empire? The Roman Empire. So, already if you know this, you should be able to solve half of the problem of false prophecy out there in the world that says that the Antichrist will arise or arose in the past in the time of Greece. No, no, no. The Bible does not say that. The Bible says he arises when once Rome is divided into its components. That's what the Bible says. And he rules until the Ancient of Days comes. Is he around here now? Well, must he be here? Sure he must be here. Are people waiting for him? Sure, what for? He's here. We shouldn't have to wait. We should just be able to say, there he is. That's very interesting. So, he shall be different from the first. So the flavor of the fourth beast is made different by whom? By him. Why different? And he is the one that's responsible for removing three whole kingdoms. Well, you remember the kingdoms, the Anglo-Saxons, the Franks, the Alemanni, the Lombards, the Arthrogoths, the Uruli, the Burgundians, the Visigoths, the Suevi, and the Vandals. Those were the ten. But there were some terribly opposed to this power. Number one, the Heruli, A.D. 493. Look where they ruled. Look where they ruled. Now, these people had an interesting philosophy. And this philosophy differed substantially from the philosophy of this other little horn power. Now, unfortunately, we have no historic documents as to what the Hiruli believed. Neither do we have any historic documents as to what the Ostrogoths believed. We have a little bit of what the Vandals believed, but none of their religious documentation. Why not? Because it has all been destroyed. So we only have information from those second hand. Apparently, history tells us today that these three powers that were re removed were Aryan in their view. In other words, that they taught that Jesus was not God and therefore had to be removed. But there is really no evidence for that whatsoever other than second-hand information by the very power that destroyed them. There's far more interesting evidence that these powers that were destroyed actually had a different gospel. A gospel that was derived from Palestine and was a much truer reflection of the biblical than any other. So is it perhaps possible that they had a Christianity derived directly from the original source and that they therefore had to be removed? It's a distinct possibility. There's quite a lot of research that has been done on it and uh, I'm not averse to that idea at all. So they were destroyed 493 AD. Now if this creature, this fourth one, uh, this new power arose amongst them, then he must have arisen already before 493. The next one to go were the Vandals, A.D. 534. They plagued the Roman Empire and they subjected large parts of the religious culture of, culture of the Byzantine and Roman world. They subjected it ferociously. And so eventually the Vandals were also destroyed by the armies of the Eastern Empire. And then came the Ostrogoths. They were the last ones. The Ostrogoths ruled until 538 AD, and they occupied first this area and later occupied and controlled the whole of the ancient Roman capital 
and surrounding areas. And the Ostrogoths also had a gospel derived, as we said, from ancient Palestine. So they had to be removed. They were tolerant of all other religions, but they were a thorn in the flesh of the little horn power, and eventually they were destroyed with the help, amongst others, of the Franks up here, who made an alliance with the kings of Constantinople, with the Caesars. And so in 538 AD, the opposition to the little horn power disappeared and it rose like a mushroom. So the Alamanni, the remnant of the ten, you know, the Germans today, the Burgundians, the Swiss, the Franks, the French, the Lombards, the Italians, the Saxons, the English, the Suevi, the Portuguese, the Visigoths, the Spanish, and the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths are eliminated, totally destroyed. In fact, these were the on, not the only ones that, uh, that waged war against, though. No, no, no. The Visigoths, for example, probably being very much related to the Ostrogoths, had similar sentiments, and there were many, many wars fought and much subjugation over here uh, before these came in line with the thinking of the Little Horn Power as well. The greatest ally of the Little Horn Power was the Franks, who are today the French, and the first one to adopt this robe upon himself was Clovis, and Clovis will go down in history as the man who more than any other helped the little horn power to come to fruition. Daniel 7 verse 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. So Daniel is watching the events down here on earth, which all seem to revolve around this little horn power, and he sees a great judgment scene taking place in heaven. Verse 10 says, The judgment was set and the books were opened. So here is a judgment scene. And I saw in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man, come with the clouds of heaven, that's an acronym for angels. We'll see that in a, in a later lecture. And came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Verse 13. So this is not the coming of Christ to this earth. This is a scene that takes place in heaven as the little horn power sets up his domain here on this earth so the judgment is ready to sit in the heavenly realm. And there was given him, this is the Son of Man, dominion and glory and a kingdom that all the people, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Verse 14. So we have a contrast over here. On the one hand, you have a kingdom being set up on earth whose seat and power lies in the little horn power, and on the other hand, you have a judgment taking place where all power will be given to Christ. So we have two powers opposed to each other. Christ, the ultimate victor in the end, and the Antichrist working against each other. The one setting up a kingdom upon this earth, the other one setting up the eternal kingdom that will never be destroyed. And the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Daniel 7 verse 18. Beautiful symbolism. Very powerful stuff. Now, let's have a look at Paul's reference to the man of sin. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 1 to 10, Paul describes when this power, this Antichrist power, will arise. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you not be soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. 
You see, some were teaching, even in Paul's days, that uh, the day of the Lord is at hand. And some were preaching that Christ was already ruling. And Paul says, no, 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 there's first some things that must happen. So the day of Christ is not there yet. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, the coming of the Lord, shall not come except there come a falling away first. So first the church goes into apostasy. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Only two folks in the Bible are called son of perdition. Only two. The one is the man of sin, and the other one was Judas. Now, how did Judas betray Jesus? With a kiss. He betrayed him with a kiss. You see, Judas pretended to still be one of them. And he betrayed Jesus. The other one, do you think he might also pretend to be one of them and betray Jesus with a kiss? Do you think it's possible on a greater scale? So, let no man deceive you by any man's, for that day the coming of the Lord will not come except there come a falling away first, apostasy in the church, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So here is a power that assumes tremendous presumptuous powers unto itself. In fact, this power is going to say, I am another God on this earth. And salvation is through me. But this power is going to be a subtle power that worked just like Judas worked. Just like Judas worked. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come and even now already is in the world. 1 John 4 verse 3. So now let's think about this. If the spirit of Antichrist was already in the world in the time of John, if Paul says there will come a falling away and then this man of sin will be revealed, then this man of sin has been with us all along. So now we've already seen that he cannot have come out of a Greek empire, because he comes out of the fourth empire, and he also cannot come in the future sometime from a tribe in Palestine. Is that correct? Would you all agree with me? Yes. All right, if that is correct, then the whole of Christianity must be lying wrong on this issue. Because half of Christianity teaches that the Antichrist came in the past. His name was Antiochus Epiphanes IV and he was a Greek king. Uh -uh. The Bible says he came out of the fourth beast and in fact after the decline of the fourth beast and the division into ten. The other half of Christianity is taught that the Antichrist will come into the future after the rapture. Now there's a problem because then the Christian church is not even part of us. But here he was already in the world, acting already in a clandestine manner in the early Christian church. So neither of those two can be right. Paul continues, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. So something is holding back this power from arising, and something is withholding it. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. So this power, this iniquitous mystery power, is already working in the world in Paul's time. So this is not a future power that will only come at the end of time. No, 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 it's been here all along. 
Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Let, or let's read the, the BBE version. There is one who is keeping back the evil till he is taken out of the way. So there was some power holding back so this little horn power could not arise. And Paul had told them what it was. Remember I told you these things, but he doesn't say it here. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So this power will be revealed when something holding it back is taken away, or some power holding it back, and then this power will be destroyed at the second coming of Christ. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, this is an interesting story. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Is it possible that this system will deceive the world into accepting a form of the gospel which is based on human values and not on divine values? And on human criteria and not on divine criteria? Is that possible? Here we have a point on which Paul we read in Romanism and the Reformation by Gratian, Paul affirms the existence of knowledge in the Christian church. So the early church knew, he says, what the hindrance was. The early church tells us what it did know upon the subject, and no one in these days can be in a position to contradict its testimony as to what Paul had by word of mouth only told the Thessalonians. It is a point on which ancient tradition alone can have authority. Modern speculation is positively impertinent on such a subject. Today, people are saying, well, what could have been holding it back? Maybe it's the Holy Spirit holding it back. Why should the Holy Spirit be holding it back? There was a power holding it back, and when that is removed, the Antichrist will arise, and he will remain until the Lord comes. So what did the early church fathers know? What did Paul told them verbally? What did he told them? But what did he not write down? Well, let's go to the early church fathers. Tertullian on the resurrections, Christian apologists of 200 AD, he says, he who now hinders must hinder until he's taken out of the way. What obstacle is there but the Roman state? the falling away of which by being scattered into ten kingdoms shall introduce Antichrist. So that's what the early church fathers believe, that when the Roman state goes, Antichrist will be revealed. Is that biblical according to Daniel chapter 7? Absolutely. When Rome divides into ten, when Roman state disappears, Antichrist will be revealed. That's what the early church fathers believe. Here's another one. John Chrysostom, homily 2, Thessalonians 2. He was Bishop of Constantinople, 390. He says, Only there is one that restraineth now until he be taken out of the way. That is when the Roman Empire is taken out of the way. Then he, Antichrist, shall come. Believe the same thing. Here's another one. Edward Elliot, who writes a commentary on the Apocalypse in 1862. He says, We have the consenting testimony of the early fathers from Irenaeus, the disciple of St. John, down to Chrysostom and Jerome to the effect that it was understood to be the imperial power ruling and residing at Rome. So it's actually quite simple. When Rome falls, the Antichrist will come. While the Caesars held imperial power, it was impossible for the predicted Antichrist to arise. On the fall of the Caesars, he would arise. There's another source. Paul did not identify the restraining power which they knew to be Rome for fear of reprisals. Remember the Christian church was under persecution by Rome. Here's another quote. So Paul didn't say, when Rome falls, he'll come. Because if he had said publicly and written, when Rome falls, he will come, he would have been in big trouble and so would the persecuted church. So the early church believed that when Rome falls, Antichrist will arise. Daniel 7 says, he will arise when Rome is divided into ten. Then he will arise. So that's the biblical criteria of when Antichrist starts ruling.
We're going to talk now about this little horn power. We have learnt up until now that he arises when? When Rome is divided. We have learnt that he comes out of this division and that he arises amongst the ten horns. And we have learnt that he shall be different from the first. Daniel 7 verse 24. And this power will stay with us until Jesus comes. That means if he arose then, he must be here today. Let's have a look at the attributes given by Daniel of the little horn power. Number one, he arises out of the fourth beast. Daniel 7, verse 7 and 8. Is everybody happy with that? So he comes out of Rome. That's where he arises. It's a Roman power. Number two, he arises amongst the ten horns. I considered the horns and beheld there came up amongst them another little horn. So he has to arise in the Western Roman Empire. It is a European power. It's not any other power on the earth. He arises after the ten horns, so he assumes his position of power sometime after 476 AD. And another shall arise after them. Verse 24. He is different from the other horns. He shall be diverse from the first. Verse 24. That's the fourth criterion. Here's another criterion. He becomes more stout than the others. More stout than his fellows. Verse 20. He has a power that becomes mightier than any of the other kingdoms. Do you know what? It shouldn't be too difficult to see what the Bible is saying. Uncomfortable, yes, but not too difficult. He uproots three kingdoms before whom three fell. Verses 20. He has eyes like a man and spoke great words against the Most High. Verses 8 and verse 25. So he lifts himself up into the position where God should be, number one. He replaces divine precepts with human precepts. And he maps out the path to heaven through the power of man and not the power of God. This is a serious, serious issue. And he speaks great things against the Most High. We'll have to look at that. And then he'll make war against the saints. He'll wear out the saints. Verse 25. So this power must have been a persecuting power that fought against those who said... Salvation is through the power of God alone. And then another criterion. He'll change times and laws. Verse 25 says he'll think to change times and laws. That's fascinating. Now which times and which laws do you think uh, God would be concerned about? Would God be concerned about silly little human laws? No. It must be modification of divine law and the times must be changing the times which God had set. For example, God set the time and it shall be evening and it shall be morning the first day and it shall be evening and it shall be morning the second day. From evening to evening went the day. That's the first time. Then there were feasts and festivals and times that were set. Would this power change all of that? Fascinating. That's the ninth criterion given in the book of Daniel. Daniel is very precise. And he will rule, they shall be given into his hand unto a time at times and the dividing of a time. Time, times and half a time. Prophetic years, three and a half. We'll deal with that. Fascinating. Verse 25. And shall devour the whole earth. The fourth beast which shall be different shall devour the whole earth. The different component of it shall devour the whole earth and shall trample it and crush it. Does that include the United States of America? Uh-huh. 
Do you think you're being controlled by someone else? Do you think you might be being, right now, being controlled by someone else? The mighty USA, do you think so? What about the mighty Russia? What about any mighty nation? What about China? Do you think they might be controlled right now by someone else? And it exists till the end, until the Ancient of Days came. Verse 22. Now, I'm not making this up. This is in the book of Daniel. You can get the book of Daniel yourselves, and you can read it. And the final criterion, His dominion will be taken away at the end of time. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. The Bible says he shall be destroyed by the brightness of the Lord's coming. So no earthly power is going to take his power away. God himself is going to intervene. Thirteen criteria. There is only one power in the whole wide world historically and otherwise, that can qualify, which is a rather sad criterion. Now, I don't want to upset anyone here this evening, and I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. But the fact of the matter is that this power is so clearly identified that I myself, who was part of that power, had to resign from that power and leave it. I was affected myself. I was very shocked when I found this out, and it actually physically made me sick when I discovered this. So who is he? He arises out of the fourth beast. He arises among the ten horns. After the ten horns, he's different from the others. When the last wave of barbarian invasions had spent its force, the face of Europe had been transformed. Independent Germanic kingdoms had been established on the ruins of the Roman Empire. That's church history, page 175. Out of the ruins of the Roman Empire there gradually arose a new order of states whose central point was the papal see. Therefore inevitably resulted a position not only new but very different from the former. The Church and Churches, page 42 and 43. This is a Roman Catholic source saying that here was a different situation to what there was before. There are two theories on the Antichrist in the world today that are being taught by every single church in the world. Almost. The one is Rivera and the other one is Alcazar's policy. Now, what did they teach? They taught preterism and futurism. Preterism teaches that the Antichrist came in the past in the time of the Greeks. Futurism teaches that he'll come in the future after the Christian church has been taken away. And both of these doctrines are not biblical because both of them violate Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8, the whole book of Revelation. They violate every single biblical principle, all of them. And who were... Ribera, and who was Alcazar? Well, the two of them were Jesuits. So these are doctrines set into the world after the Reformation by the Roman Church itself to take away the emphasis from the papacy and put them in two different directions. Historian C.C. Eckhart, when the Roman Empire had disintegrated and its place had been taken by a number of rude, barbarous kingdoms, the Roman Catholic Church not only became independent of the state in religious affairs, but dominated secular affairs as well. The Papacy and World Affairs, page 1. So here was a horn, a kingdom that became more stout than the others. It dominated them. It qualifies. Historian Thomas Hobbes says, if a man consider the origin of the great ecclesiastical dominion, he will easily perceive that the papacy is none other than the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire sitting crowned upon the grave thereof. Okay, so Rome is not really gone. It's called the Roman Catholic Church, isn't it? So Rome is not really gone at all. Leviathan, page 457. He shall be different from the first. We saw that Rome says, yes, we're different. 
Because now it is a religious power that wields political clout. More stout than his fellows, Daniel 7.20. He would be mightier than the other kings. Did the kings of Europe bow down to the papacy? Yes, sometimes yes, sometimes no. If no, eventually they were subjugated and did bow down. Eventually they did have to come like Frederick of Germany and stand barefoot in the snow waiting for a reprieve to get his kingdom back. The Most Holy Councils, Volume 13, Rome says, we define that the Holy Apostolic See and the Roman Pontiff holds the primacy over how much of the world? The whole world. That's interesting. The Vicar of the Incarnate Son of God, anointed High Priest and Supreme Temporal Ruler, the Pope, sat in his tribunal impartially to judge between nation and nation, people and prince, sovereign and subject. Henry Connell Manning, Temporal Power of the Vicar of Jesus Christ. So, did they say that they were in control of all the other kingdoms? Yes or no? Yes, they claim so themselves. Keys of this blood, Pope John Paul II versus Russia and the West for control of the new world order. Malachi Martin, pontifical professor at the Gregorian University in Rome itself. He's saying it, not me. Uprooted three kingdoms, then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, and of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell. Daniel 7, 19 and 20. Yes, Rome claims that the three were uprooted because they were Arian, they didn't believe that Christ was God, which is one of the teachings of Rome. But we will see that that is just an exoteric teaching of Rome. There is another teaching of Rome which is called esoteric, which is a hidden teaching which says something completely different, but that'll take another lecture. It has eyes like a man and it spoke great words against the Most High. Here's a system that sets itself up above God and will speak against the Most High and it will wear out the saints. There was given him a mouth speaking great things and Blasphemy, says verse 5. Blasphemy. So what is blasphemy? And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Did the Roman church do this? Absolutely. Daniel 7.25, He shall speak great words against the Most High, shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Think to change times and laws. Of course you can't change God's laws. It's just the power that thinks it can. And they shall be given into his hand until the time, times, and the dividing of times. We'll have to look at those texts in detail. Let's first look at the biblical definition of blasphemy and see whether Rome qualifies. Well, we find it in John chapter 10, verse 30 and 33. I and the Father are one, says Jesus. Jesus says he's God. The Jews answered him, saying, We do not stone you for a good work, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself God. So the one definition in the Bible of blasphemy is if someone says that he's God. Well, <laughs> there are many blasphemers in the world today, but uh, that's the one definition. The other definition we find in Luke, where it says, And seeing their faith, he said to the man, Your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins except God alone? So there are two biblical definitions of blasphemy. The one is if you say that you are God, and the other one is if, if you say that you can forgive sins. Well, what does the Rome say? Here's the Catholic Encyclopedia, Volume 12, article on the Pope. It says, this judicial authority will even include the power to pardon sin. So Rome says it can forgive sins. The Catholic priest, page 78, says, Seek where you will through heaven and earth, and you will find one created being who can forgive the sinner, who can free him from the chains of hell. That extraordinary being is the priest, the Roman Catholic priest. Interesting. The outer priest forever, says the ordaining bishop, he is no longer a man, a sinful child of Adam, but an altar Christos another Christ. That's interesting. 
another Christ in the place of Jesus Christ, in the place of, in Greek is anti Christos, Antichrist, in the place of. Forever a priest of the Most High with power over the Almighty. Now that's heavy to say that you have more power than God. The Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ himself, hidden under the veil of flesh, the Catholic National, July 1895. So Rome has always claimed that she is in the position of God. God himself is obliged to abide by the judgment of his priests and either not to pardon or to pardon, according as they, the priests, refuse or give absolution. The sentence of the priest precedes, and God subscribes to it. Dignities and Duties of the Priest, volume 12, page 27. Wow. So the Catholic Church says who is saved and who is lost, and God hasn't got a hope. He has to abide by their judgment. And if they say no, God can't say yes. So who's mightier, they or God? They are. Is this blasphemy, yes or no? This is blasphemy of the highest order. Cardinal Bellamine says, all names which in Scripture are applied to Christ by virtue of which it is established that he is over the church, all the same names are applied to the Pope. That means he assumes the place of God. So he qualifies on that count. Given in Rome from our palace the 10th of February 1817, the 15th jurisdiction of the Most Holy Pontiff and Father in Christ and our Lord, our God, the Pope Leo XII. So the Pope had himself crowned as God. We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty, the great ecclesiastical letters of Pope Leo. Did you know that when the papacy today writes an encyclical, it always signs the encyclical, Pope John Paul II, in other words, does this, given by us, capital letter, in our capital letter, pontificates. Interesting. Because God says, let us make man in our image. Capitals. So the papacy takes the prerogative and to this day by their writing they claim to have and be the power of God. So, Rome qualifies. The Most High Council we define that the Holy Apostolic See and the Roman Pontiff hold the primacy over the whole world. Now this power would eventually take control of the whole world. Does Rome really control the world? That's ludicrous. Do you really believe that? Think it's possible? Well, we're going to have a lecture tomorrow on secret societies. I wouldn't miss it if I were you. Thomas Aquinas wrote, secular power, this is the great Catholic philosopher that is quoted by John Paul II more than any other philosopher of the Roman Catholic Church. He's, he writes, secular power is subject to the spiritual power as the body is subject to the soul. And therefore it is not a usurpation of authority if the spiritual prelate interfere in temporal things concerning those matters in which the secular power is subject to him. So everybody is subject to Rome. The Council of Trent declared all temporal power is his. The dominion, the jurisdiction, and the government of the whole earth is his by divine right. All rulers of the earth are his subject and must submit to him. That was the Council of Trent. That's the one that ended the attack of the Reformation. Here we have a lady who said, uh, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. And this lady said, it's like being with God when she saw John Paul II. Did she wear out the saints? It was given him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Well, again, Thomas Aquinas said, that convicted heretics should be put to death just as surely as other criminals. The Catholic Church is a respecter of conscience and of liberty. Nevertheless, when confronted with heresy, 
She has resource to force, to corporal punishment, to torture. She lit in Italy the funeral piles of the Inquisition. Catholic professor Alfred Budrat, the Catholic Church, Renaissance Protestantism. Yes, she admits it. Here is the Chiesa del Jesu, which is the seat of the Jesuits. Here is the Jesuit oath that is made, which basically says that they can get rid of any heretical king in the entire world, any commonwealth of governments that does not want to subject itself to the papacy, and anybody who does not submit to the authority of the Roman pontiff can be safely destroyed. So the church ruled as the woman ruling over kings. That is how she depicted herself throughout history. The Inquisition, well, the Inquisition tells us that she wore out the saints, the Tower of London, the Hague in the Netherlands. What is the definition of heresy? Greek heresis, choice, deciding for oneself what one shall believe and practice. That's heresy. So who must decide for you? Rome must decide for you what you must believe. And if you do not fall in line with this, well, then you must be eliminated. You must be eradicated. Well, we are heading for some thunderous times in the world that we live in today. These are some of the instruments of torture that they used. These were terrible things. These tongs over here were opened up and they were, could close like two little buckets making a little ball. They would put hot coals in there and then sort you out that way. They would... Uh, put these shackles around you. These were put around the feet. Notice the pins on the inside. They would go right into the bone. They were so wicked. This one over here went around the neck and then they would tighten the screw and of course it would push right here into your Adam's apple. And in fact, uh, General Franco in the 1970s in Spain still used that instrument of torture. Can you believe that? How primitive can you get? And the stocks, and the thumb screws, and this terrible thing over here, where they would hoist you upside down with your hands behind your back and lift you up this way, high above, and hang you from a ceiling. And then they'd attach this ball on a high shelf, this heavy stone, to your feet, roll it down, and rip your arms right up. That was pretty mean, the way they did. This are or representations of the pyres, the stakes of the Inquisition, and they killed literally millions and millions of people. This is the famous Huguenot monument in Africa where the French Huguenots escaped and uh, after the great massacre where the Huguenots were massacred, Bartholomew massacre, and they depicted themselves as a woman, a church, escaping with a Bible in her hand and the chains of Rome torn loose. Well, I have news for you. This woman is once again chained. And every other woman on the planet, talking of churches, is once again chained. Changes times and laws. Think to change times and laws. Daniel 7, 25. Does the Pope claim that he changed God's law? Absolutely. Decretal, de translat, episcop. The Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. That's arrogance of the highest order. So they say that they can change these things. Did the papacy change the times? Certainly did. What calendar are we keeping in the world today? Who knows? We're keeping the Gregorian calendar. Who was Gregory? He was a Pope. And were the times changed? Yes. On the authority of whom? Of the Jesuit astronomers. What did they change? They changed Easter. They brought the Easter feasts to bring them in line with the feast of Easter. They even called it that. Easter, Easter. Easter feast. And so, whereas the Pash was celebrated according to the new moon, and the Passover could take place on any day of the week, depending on when the new moon was sighted. So the papacy changed it and followed the symbolism of the Sadducees, who were trained in Alexandria in occult teaching, and moved it in line with the Feast of Ishtar. 
And now Easter falls only on a Sunday and never coincides with the Passover. It is possible with the calendar that they have that at some stage in history it can actually coincide with the Passover. And what does the papacy then decree? If there happens to be a lining up of the Passover with the Feast of Easter, then the papacy shifts Easter one week so that it will still fall on the Sunday. So she changed the times and the feasts, definitely. Also, since these times, we are celebrating the day from midnight to midnight and not from sunset to sunset. And then did she abrogate the laws and dispense with the things and the precepts of Christ? The Pope can modify divine law, prompta biblioteca. Who gives you the right, Mr. Pope, to change the law of God? The Ten Commandments, as originally given by God on the first tablet, you shall have no other gods before me. Then there is this big commandment that you shall not bow down to idols. And then you may not take the name of the Lord your vain. The Sabbath commandment is very prominent. And then you have the commandments um, dictating the relationship between man and man. Honor your father and your mother. Shalt not kill. Adultery. Uh, theft. Uh, thou shalt not bring false witness and covetousness. Those are the commandments as they are in the Bible. If you take the Catholic Catechism, you'll see that the second commandment has been removed. You shall not have other gods. You shall not... Uh, he shall be able to change laws, of course, he says. They'll, I am the Lord of God. You shall have no strange gods before me. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. So the second commandment is gone. This one has moved one up. Remember to keep holy the Sabbath day. But what have they done to that? We'll see about that in a moment. And so they only have nine commandments. And to get ten, they take the commandment on coveting and split it into two. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, and thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods. Very fascinating. Remember that this one over here says, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. So they turn it round. Isn't that fascinating? They even have the gall to turn it round, as if they had the right to do that. The Catholic Encyclopedia says, the church, after changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath, or well, the seventh day of the week to the first made the third commandment refer to Sunday, because the second one was gone now, as the day to be kept holy as the Lord's Day, Catholic Encyclopedia. So they changed the times. Even the day of worship, which was the seventh day, was shifted to the first day of the week. Matthew 5.17 says, Think not that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I came not to destroy but to fulfill, to live them out. Here's the Converts Catechism of the Catholic Doctrine, page 50, and it says, Question, which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. The Catholic Church is well aware of it, they know it. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea transferred the solemnity from the Saturday to the Sunday. So did she change times and laws, yes or no? Yes, she did. Times, times, and half a time. What does that refer to? The saints will be handed over to him for a time, times, and half a time. If you have a modern Bible, it'll say three and a half years. Now, prophetic years are different to normal years. A year in a prophetic sense, had 360 days because the Hebrew year had 360 days. So, 360, two times, 720, half a time, half a year, 180. Add them all up, that would give you 1,260 prophetic days. Now, that becomes 1,260 literal years. Let's just sort this out. With the conquest of Rome by Belisarius commences the history of the Middle Ages. So when Rome was conquered and the Ostrogoths were removed, the history of the Middle Ages started. Philip Shape says, Vigilus ascended the papal chair 538 AD 
under the military protection of Belisarius. So when did the little horn power assume its authority? The answer is 538 AD, because the last of the little horns, or of the horn powers that kept him back were the Ostrogoths. They were removed in 538 AD, and Vigilius ascends the papal chair. So the dominance of Rome begins. Another shall arise after them, the Ten Kingdoms, established A.D. 476. After them, A.D. 538, papal rule commences. According to a decree which was issued by Justinian, Emperor of Rome, who said that the Pope will be the corrector of heretics and the ruler of all the churches. Now, 538... If you add 1,260, you come to 1,798. 1798. What happened in 1798? Berthier entered Rome on the 10th of February, 1798, and proclaimed a republic. Half of Europe thought Napoleon's veto would be obeyed and that with the Pope, the papacy was dead. So exactly according to prophetic time, and the Bible tells us to take a day for a year, exactly according to that time, when the clock struck, 1798, the temporal power of the papacy was halted for a while. So 1,260-year time prophecy. 476 AD, the Ten Kingdoms are established. 538 AD, the bishop officially recognized as the ruler of all the churches. 1,260 years of time prophecy brings us to 1798 fulfilled. His domain and dominion ended. 1,260 years, it was based on 1,260 days, which is the same as three and a half prophetic years, but it's also the same as 42 months. 42 times 30, that was the biblical month. 42 times 30 is also 1,260. Now in Revelation 12, verse 6, we read, 1,203 score days. That's 1,260 days. In Revelation 12, 14, a time, times, and half a time. See how Revelation picks up the theme of this power and brings it into the heart of Revelation? Here they all are. Daniel 7.25, time, times, and the dividing of time, referring to this power. Daniel 12.7, time, times, and a half. Revelation 11.2, 42 months. Revelation 11.3, 1260 days. Revelation 12.6, 1260 days. Revelation 12.14, time, times, and a half a time. Revelation 13.5, 40 and two months. All of these referring to the same power. Notice how many there are. One, two, three, four, Five, six, seven. The Bible is fantastic. What's it telling us? That this power would set itself up as another God. Because seven is the number of God. And it would assume all these characteristics. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed. Rome receives a wound in the form of the little horn power, but it's going to be healed. And all the world wandered after the beast. Revelation 13, 3. So the same power that ruled over the saints for 1,260 days receives a mortal wound, 1798, will rise again, and the whole world will be subject to it. That's what the Bible says. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Does that include the United States? Does that include my country? Yes, it does. Ronald Reagan and the papacy made a holy alliance. That's a fascinating story. We'll have to go into that into a little bit more detail. And so even the mighty United States subjected itself to this power. Here we have a signal picture between Gorbachev and the papacy. This is the mighty Soviet Union at that stage, greeting and acknowledging this power. 
It is a big idea, a new world order where diverse nations are drawn together in a common cause. Only the United States has both the moral standing and the means to back it up. At the Second Vatican Council, this was a 1962 document, it states, It is our duty, therefore, to strain every muscle in working for the time when all war will be completely outlawed by international consent. This is the Second Vatican Council. This goal undoubtedly requires the establishment of a universal public authority acknowledged as such by all and endowed with the power to safeguard on behalf of all security, regard for justice, and respect for rights. Pope Paul VI wrote in the section entitled Towards Effective World Authority, he wrote, This international collaboration on a worldwide scale requires institutions that will prepare, coordinate, direct it, until finally there is established an order of justice which is universally recognized. Who does not see the necessity of thus establishing progressively a world authority capable of acting effectively in judicial and political sectors? Fascinating stuff. And who was crowned ruler of the whole world? This man himself. Fascinating. John Paul, superstar. Maastricht, the United Europe. What has the world to say about this? Why has the Parliament of Europe got this construction? A very interesting construction. We'll give a whole lecture on this interesting situation in Europe and what it means. What did uh, George W. Bush say about this power? March 22, he said, the best way to honor Pope John Paul II, truly one of the great men, is to take his teaching seriously, is to listen to his words, and put his words and teachings into action here in America. This is a challenge we must accept. So who is subject to who here? Who is subject to who? In 1991, the Pope called for a new world order. Well, what was his New Year's speech about this year? He had only one message, and he said it's time to establish the world authority right now. That was his request. He visited the United Nations. He spoke on behalf of all the religions in the entire world. Now please note that that includes Buddhism and Hinduism and Shintoism and Zoroastrianism and Protestantism and Catholicism and the whole shooting match. Is there an agenda? And Gorbachev said, we must help John Paul II, because he is right in his request for a new world order, said Gorbachev, when the Pope spoke at the United Nations at its 50th celebration. All right. Do you think it is possible that Rome could be this power? That the Vatican could be this power? But surely the Vatican looks like a noble Christian power trying to set the right values into the world. Doesn't it look like that? Remember the Bible says, man of perdition, Judas looked like one of them, but he betrayed Jesus with a kiss. Here is a power that looks like one of them, but could just betray it with a kiss. We'll have to go into the secrets of the secret societies to find out what this is all about. What did the reformers teach on this power? Many of the great Christians of the Reformation and post-Reformation times shared this view of prophetic truth and identified Antichrist with the Roman papacy. Among the adherents of this interpretation were the Valdenses, the Hussites, Wycliffe, Luther, Calvin, Swingley, Melanchthon, the Baptist theologian John Gill, the Martyrs, Cranmer, Tyndale, Latimer, Ridley. All of them said Rome was the Antichrist. Let's see what Martin Luther said. Luther said, I know that the Pope is Antichrist and that his seat is that of Satan himself. 
The papacy is a general chased by command of the Roman pontiff for the purpose of running down and destroying souls. That's pretty straight talk. He didn't mince words in those days. What did John Calvin say? He said, we, recall, we call the Roman pontiff Antichrist. Interesting. What did John Wesley say? He said, he is in the emphatic sense the man of sin as he increases all manner of sin above measure. That's what the reformers said. What did John Knox say? He said that the Pope should be recognized as the very Antichrist. Well, the reformers didn't want anyone to forget. So in Nuremberg, which was the seat of Protestantism, on the town hall they had this sculpture presented over the two doors. And if you look over here, you'll find something interesting. You'll find the prophecy we dealt with tonight. On the one side, you have a lion with eagle's wings, and they have a ruler next to him, and they tell us who he is. It is Nebuchadnezzar. So who did the reformers say the lions with eagle wings stood for? Babylon. If we go to the other side, you have a bear with three ribs in his mouth, and they've put a king next to him, a mighty king, to tell us who they believed it represented. And who was it? This is Cyrus the Great. So hereby they are saying it was the Medes and the Persians. The reformers didn't mince words. They put it in stone. You can go and see it today. If you go to the other side, you'll see the other door. That's what it looks like. Let's go a little bit closer. There is a leopard beast with four heads. And who do they put next to it to say who they believed it was? That's Alexander the Great. So they identified it with Greece. And on the other side is a terrible beast with ten horns. And they have a mighty emperor there. And who is he? He's Julius Caesar. So who did they say it was? They said it was Rome. And then over here, they have this strange little structure coming up amongst them. And it has the face of a man. And it has this strange little crown. They made no bones as to who it was. They said it was Rome. Who teaches that today still? Nobody. Nobody teaches it anymore. Do the Christian churches teach it? No, they don't. In fact, they have all joined the ecumenical movement, which says, let's again accept Rome as our spiritual leader. All the Christian denominations a part of the ecumenical movement. And all of them are saying, put the chains back on. Rather sad. Let not anyone deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come unless the first comes of falling away, and the man of sin shall be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself over all that is called God, all that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, setting himself forth that he is God. Does this make sense now? It certainly does. If it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. The garb of Christianity is so perfect that we do not see the core of occultism behind it. Who really runs the show there? Who is behind it? What power is yielded in Rome? Who is the black pope? Who is Peter Hans Kolvenbach at the moment? Who is that? What is his role in the world? Would you like to know? So we see, he shall devour the whole earth. That means this web of intrigue must spread across the whole world. And he will continue to the end. He's here right now. But his dominion will be taken away at the end of time. Now, I am not saying that any Roman Catholic who is not aware of any of this which is in the Bible is Antichrist. I'm talking about a system here. This is a system. There are many, many fine Roman Catholics in the Roman Catholic Church who worship God according to the best knowledge and according to the conscience that they have. And God takes the knowledge that they have, and judges according to the knowledge that they have. I'm talking about a system that has deceived even its own members, and that sets itself up above God. 
The Bible says, The judgment shall sit and they shall take away his rulership to cut off and to destroy until the end, and the kingdom and the rulership will belong to who? Will belong to God's people. For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. And the greatness of the kingdoms under all the heavens, says Daniel, shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all kingdoms shall serve and obey him. God is going to make an end of all things very soon. And to find out what the intrigue behind the intrigues are, I invite you to come to the next lectures. Even if you were upset tonight, it's very important that you come to the next lectures because this whole plan will be unfolded as we go into the book of Revelation. May the Lord be with you and help you and guide you.